A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. As the crippled man who had been cured clung to Peter and John, all the people hurried in amazement toward them in the portico called Solomon's Portico. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, you children of Israel, why are you amazed at this? And why do you look so intently at us as if we had made him walk by our own power or piety? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death, but God raised him from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, this man whom you see and know, his name has made strong, and the faith that comes through it has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Now I know, brothers and sisters, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away, <clears throat> and that the Lord may grant you times of refreshment and send you the Christ already appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the times of universal restoration, of which God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. For Moses said, a prophet like me will the Lord your God raise up for you from among your own kin. To him you shall listen in all that he may say to you. Everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be cut off from the people. Moreover, all the prophets who spoke from Samuel and those afterwards also announced these days. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your ancestors when he said to Abraham, in your offspring, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Bebum Domini. have made him little less than a god. With glory and honor you crowned him, gave him power over the works of your hand, put all of things under his feet. Savage beasts, birds. 
birds of the air and fish that make their way through the waters. O Lord, our God, how wonderful your name in all the Dominus vobiscum. Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. The disciples of Jesus recounted what had taken place along the way and how they had come to recognize him in the breaking of bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Verbum Domini. My dear friends, in Jesus, the risen Lord. As we say in Polish, niech będzie pochwalony Jezus Chrystus, which means praise be Jesus Christ now and forever. It is a real pleasure and honor for me to be with all of you today, thanks to Father Anthony the Superior, and we join prayers for our dear Mother Angelica. It has been a year since I had the joy of joining in Holy Mass here in this special place, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity during the Easter week and the Novena of Divine Mercy to reflect and share with you something that's very dear to, to me and I know to all of you, the story and message of Divine Mercy. Why it is not possible to exhaust or even really touch upon every aspect of the richness of the Divine Mercy devotion, 
I hope that my reflection today and tomorrow will help us all to understand better, as well as to appreciate more and hopefully implement into our lives better the very practical, attainable, and powerful spiritual richness of the divine mercy devotion. I'd like to begin by offering today a brief overview of the spirituality which animate the divine mercy devotion. Tomorrow we will look and an often overlooked factor, Marian devotion, which is an essential element to not only properly understand the spirituality, but also to living it out effectively. The spirituality of Divine Mercy devotion incorporates many features. It cannot be separated from the spiritual school of which St. Faustina was a part, nor from the wonderful richness of the church's spiritual heritage throughout the ages. And because it is important to remember that this devotion is a gift from God, revealed to us because of the needs of our time, we cannot overlook the particular circumstances of our contemporary times which have called it forth. All of these themes really come together beautifully when we take a look at the person of the messenger of mercy herself, Saint Faustina Kowalska. Saint Faustina, the apostle of divine mercy, belonged today among the group of the most popular and well-known saint in the church. In many countries, she became one of us. Through her, the Lord Jesus communicated to the whole world the great message of God's mercy and revealed the pattern of Christian perfection based on trust in God and on the attitude of mercy toward one's neighbor. Born 1905 and called home to the Lord after reaching the perfect age of Jesus, 33 years later, she is very much a person of our day and age. Had she lived to what we now consider normal age, you can see how her life would have easily overlapped with most of ours here today. She's a contemporary woman with contemporary struggles who also employ contemporary means to achieve great spiritual depth. How she did this is a path open to all of us as well. The fact that Saint Faustina was blessed with the gift of extraordinary deep union with God in her spiritual life does not mean that the path she followed, the one revealed to her by our Lord, is unattainable to us. On the contrary, she lived her life in the most ordinary way as a sister of the congregation of Our Lady of Mercy and knew the normal, ordinary circumstances of life to nurture a lively spiritual life. Therefore, the first lesson we have to we have of the spirituality of divine mercy devotion is that it takes advantage of the ordinary, the normal, everyday stuff of life, and then turn it into a means of growing closer to God. When you think about it in our lives, big events and special occasions usually only have to come around every once in a while or so, don't they? But we spend a lot of our time focusing in and preparing for them, don't we? However, where is it that we actually spend most of our time? In that zone, which we call the ordinary, or the typical of the regular, every day. If we could only learn to give enough of our time and effort to this part of our life, then we'd be on our way. Well. The divine mercy spirituality help us to do it. A second part of the spirituality is one which I think is perhaps the most foundational of all. It is ecclesially center. What do I mean by that? It is based on the participation in the life of the church. Saint Faustina was a faithful daughter of Holy Mother Church. She took seriously her membership in the body of Christ and knew that like every other member, she had a role to play in building it up. 
and continued the saving work of Jesus. The Lord revealed to her that her part in this mission would be to serve as the apostles of mercy. And she offered her life for this very intention. This aspect is further beautifully witnessed to by noting two of the most distinguishing characteristic of St. Faustina's own spirituality. A great love for our Lord truly present in the Holy Eucharist and a deep and abiding devotion to our Blessed Mother. As you can see, since there is no Eucharist without the Church and no Jesus without Mary, who is Mother of the Church, there can be no spirituality for St. Faustina and no divine mercy devotion without church either. This is something that is very important for us to remember in our own lives too. There are plenty of lone rangers out there these days who think they can do things their own way. They don't need any or anything like the church telling them what to do or even suggesting that there might be another way different from the from the one they've chosen. There are plenty of others who are comfortable picking and choosing what it is they will believe while ignoring or dismissing whatever it is they don't agree with. The terrible problem with this and other similar attitude is that they go against the very recipe for success which Jesus himself gave us. Alone, you can do nothing, but with God, all things are possible. And how is it that we, in fact, go with God? How do we come into contact with him to invite him into our lives and along on a journey? Through prayers? Yes, of course. Through many ways in which the Lord can manifest himself to us in the world and through other people? Absolutely. But no way can we find a more concrete and tangible contact with God than through our active participation in the life of the church and our celebration of the sacrament. They are, after all, God's special gifts given to help us on our way. This is a path open to us all. This is why in our very gathering here today, in this celebration of Holy Mass, Let's look at the ways in which the Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us of the presence of Christ in our midst. This is what we believe. First of all, the Lord is truly present. Body, blood, soul, and divinity in the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle. The real presence of Jesus is here among us. The Lord is present too in the person of the priest, unworthy though he is who act in persona Christi, that is, the person of Christ, when officially carrying out the sacred duties entrusted to him by our Savior. He is truly present in the proclamation of the sacred scripture just read for us. The living, efficacious word of God brings to us the inspiring presence of God. He is, of course, made present during this Mass when the word of consecration are said, providing us here with the food from heaven, who nourishes us spiritually on our journey of faith. And from the mouth of Jesus himself, we know from the scripture that where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am present in their midst. This is the power of the resurrection, of the resurrection Lord. The living presence of Jesus and he made the church gather together to pray in his name. And finally, but perhaps most importantly, St. Paul reminds us that we are all temples of the Holy Spirit. So we really have no further to look for the Lord than into our own hearts, which happens to be the place he liked most of all to dwell. If you remove yourself from the presence of the church, and can you still have the Lord present with you in some way? The answer is yes. But can it be in the fullness which he wishes to share with us? The answer is not at all. 
This leads us to the final point about the spirituality of divine mercy. It can best be described not as a static thing, but as a living reality. While it can be nurtured there, it is not something which can stay behind Pauline or Franciscan monastery walls, so to speak. It is something which must be lived out. In this sense, it might even be better for us to speak of the divine mercies not having spirituality, but rather of it being a way of life. This is how Saint Faustina viewed it. She saw three primary tasks, which when put together make this happen. The first part is very basic. Understand the beautiful gift God, God gives us in his merciful love, as revealed in the scripture and tradition. Why this is a gift meant for every human being in the world. We can share it with others, what we first don't bother to possess ourselves. Secondly, the gift you have received, give as a gift. Jesus said in the gospel, it could be more true than when speaking of the gifts of divine mercy. Implore God's mercy for the entire world, for sinners, for those who stand in most in need, for a family and friends, for everyone. Practice the form of devotion unique to the divine mercy, the chaplet, powerful prayer from heaven. Mercy Sunday beautifully, solemnly proclaimed to the whole world by beloved Pope John Paul II in 2000 year jubilee after the canonization of Saint Faustina. The hour of mercy, the image of mercy. In reaching out to others, we imitate the generous love of God himself. The third point is the logical conclusion to the other two. After understanding the gift of God's mercy and implore it for others, don't forget to take advantage of it and implement it on our lives as well. If we can trust in God's mercy, we can extend it to our neighbors as well, not because of any particular merit or attribute on our part, but remember, with God, all things are possible. And by giving this God, we unlock the realm of possibility in our own lives too. Divine mercy way of life is beautiful, doable, and realistic. I hope and pray that at these days of divine mercy novena unfold and we all dig deeper into its richness, we we'll all find ourselves a little closer to God, a little more vibrant in our faith, a little more sure of our path, and a little more productive member of the church striving in our own ordinary way to contribute in building up the kingdom of God. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit.